co-host just moved. Thank you. All right, so just waiting for the room again. Put in the chat where you're calling from. Any <coughs> favourite Cockney comedians other than Arthur? <laughs> and what? So. Yeah. Oh, sorry, then. Okay, so uh, a couple of minutes and let's get the show on the road. So welcome to Are You Having a Laugh? Uh, is there such a thing as Cockney humour? Uh, a fabulous panel discussion we're going to enter today. Uh, and really, just before I introduce you to the panel, just a bit of background about why we're here. So um, I'm here with my good friend, Cypher Zmani. Uh, Cypher and I have started uh, the Modern Cockney Festival. This is the very first one this year. It's been uh, going fantastically well. Um, as I say, my background is born in the East End of London at the East End Maternity Hospital. Uh, grew up in Balfron Tower, which is so posh they made it, uh, gave it a preservation order or whatever. Um, and I've read a book called Tube Spiration about how to get great ideas on the London Tube and run creativity classes on the London Tube. But uh, as I'm passionate about uh, my where I'm from, my heritage, uh, I moved away from the East End when I went to university many years ago. But as someone said, you can take Andy out of the East End, but you can't take the East End out of Andy. Uh, Sife, I mean, do you want to say a bit about yourself, mate, so let people know who you are? Yeah, my name's Sife Osmani. Today, I'm not normally normally around Canary Wharf, but today I am um, um, in the main tower and obviously it changed quite a lot here, <laughs> but uh, I'm a, I'm originally from Whitechapel actually and brought up around Upton Park. And my real thing um, really came through campaigning where I've noticed a lot of the Cockney spaces around us, like there on the left um, from uh, Andy's presentation, you can see a lot of these standards changing, huge swathes of it under redevelopment and with it although we're financializing a lot of the culture and heritage is very much under threat or really being shifted so i've been working a long term with saving street markets which i'm really excited about constantly bang on about it um in 2016 we uh, came up with a, uh with the bengali eastern heritage society off the back of the eastern preservation society and the jewish eastern celebration society and we thought well why don't we do our own one so uh, we've been doing a lot of recent campaign including the sacred campaign so i'm really excited about um hearing all the speakers today thank you yeah. and as i say so we're here today and we come back because originally um we start, uh, started a, an initiative in response to a story that cockney was apparently to disappear from the streets of london in 30 years um and in response to that uh, we set up something called uh, speak cockney day uh, and then it really developed then into last year the cockney conversations month to this year the very first uh, modern cockney festival so we've, i've got a great panel here today uh, dr mary Irwin, arthur smith uh, and tom carradine um, and as I say, I'll introduce each of them as we speak in turn to them. And uh, as I say, we're exploring this issue of is there such a thing as London human? How does it manifest itself? Uh, and what does it consist of? Uh, really, just before that, some observations. Um, so you think actually Cockney's could be well sourced, well suited uh, for the idea of uh, Cockney. I love the quote from the book over 100 years ago, uh, the autobiography of a soup, The Soup Trap by W.H. Davis, where he wrote... Cockneys make good beggars. They are held in high esteem by the fraternity in America. Their resource, originality and invention and never faltering tongue enables them to often attain their ends where others fail and they succeed where the natives starve. So in some ways, as I say, you think we're well equipped uh, for you know, humour uh, and being uh, particularly good at it. Uh, issues, as I say, as a subject, um, uh, this is a great tool called Google Engram, which traces use of words. So I'll put in Cockney humour, and it's been sort of various high points, but also some low, uh, and some you know some good growth in the last forty years. Although um, a concerning dip over the last six or seven years, which obviously we can try and do something about via the modern festival. So it's always been there as Cockney humour has been recognised, uh, varying degrees of interaction involvement, and uh, I say just some observations. I happen to be delving through some old issues of Punch magazine, um, and so Cockney is a sort of um, a, a subject for humour, there's been one dimension where it's actually sort of been really sort of using uh, um, uh, laughing at people who identify as Cockney and uh, 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 reveal themselves as Cockney. Uh, here's one here, a lady in a shop. Um, have you got any old strawberry jam? 
No, miss, all ours is quite new, says the shopkeeper. So you can see there an example, really, of like, um, you know, sort of taking, uh, looking down upon deriding the Cockney. Um, I'll write this one more, where like the sort of the, ca uh, the cab drive, which apparently uh, my great granddad was a, or a handsome cab, whatever. Anyway, so old lady, uh, you know the Warlock, when you turn to the right, past the Jolly Garden, until you come to the Red Line. Artful cabbie. Oh, don't tell me the houses, Mum. Name some of the churches, and then I shall know where I am. Ask and gets an exorbitant fare without a murmur. Some things never change. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I like that in terms of revealing a sense of humour about maybe a sort of sense of pride, defiance, um, you know, standing up for yourself. And, and then this one here, where um, a nervous philanthropist um, on a slumming excursion. And I think that one of the points we're covering with Mary is about, it's interesting how humour can provide great insight into social history and commentary. So apparently, you know, there used to be like slumming safaris in Victorian times. So anyway, the nervous philanthropist. Um, can you tell me if this is a little Erebus Street, my man? Suspicious looking party. Yes. Nervous. Uh, rather a rough sort of thoroughfare, isn't it? Suspicious looking person. Yes, it is a bit thick. The further you go down, the thicker it gets. I live in the last house. Exit philanthropist hurriedly in the opposite direction. And I like that in the sense of a sort of um, using humour, really. There's a bit of way of asserting your pride that, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, standing up for yourself, humour, like, you know, it, give you a greater sense of identity. Uh, and I'm going to try and come off the share here and hopefully get this to work on the <clears> computer <throat> there. I'll bear me a second here. Uh, do, 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 bear me a second here. And all right. In fact, I'm cocking this up, guys. I'm going to come off this. But um, anyway, bear me a second here. Do, 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 do. Cocking it up. Yeah, cocking up is a well-known phrase, a technical term on Zoom presentations. Oh, thanks for the translation. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, and I'll talk you through this one. So a scene a couple of years ago where Chelsea fans were in the news, racist incidents uh, on the Paris metro where they wouldn't let a black man on the train, uh, followed the following Saturday by West Ham fans uh, with a, a black guy walking along the platform saying, uh, oh, oh, I'm a West Ham fan, what how, how this is. And uh, he goes to the train guys and says, excuse me, I'm... Uh, can I get on the train? And the guy said, yes, mate, this is West Ham. Welcome aboard. And I like that as an example. Hey, I've got to confess I'm a West Ham fan. But again, using humour to really make social observations, stand up, so taking the mickey out of each other. Uh, with um, uh, our modern Cockney Festival, we talk about inclusive tribalism, where tribalism has always been inherent in human nature. Uh, but if we can do it on an inclusive basis, that we respect each other, that I being who I am doesn't stop who you are being yourself. So it's about the uh, humour there about uh, sharing about um, uh, a response to situation, an original wit, original humour. Apologies for the technical cock up there. OK, well, let's move on this. Let's move on now to our first of our panellists. So uh, Dr Mary Irwin from Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, a uh, leading expert on regional British humour, a cultural historian, TV studies specialist, uh, and you've got the, a new book coming out um, in the autumn, Mary. So let me come off the share there, Mary. And uh, firstly, tell us more about the book. When, uh, when, uh, it's coming out in September, you said? Yeah, hopefully. So as a, a TV study academic, um, I'm really aware that humour and comedy, and particularly situation comedy, isn't like high up in the list of priorities. You know, it's not writing about Hitchcock or film noir or something. So this book is a collection of chapters um, about comedies from all around the UK and Northern Ireland and Ireland, which really mean a lot to people. And... I'm really interested in comedy because I think it offers a real, like a little capsule of what it's like to be in a particular place at a particular time. And it's a really interesting, I suppose, critic, academic, Raymond Williams. And he talks about the structure of feeling or experience. And this book is all about the experience, the specificity of comedies based in everywhere from Gavin and Stacey in Wales. We've got... Um, Dairy Girls from Northern Ireland, um, Father Ted uh, from Ireland. We've got stuff about the North, Victoria Wood's work. Um, great work on uh, Michaela Cole's work about being a young woman growing up in Taram, let's East London, which I'm guessing the, the, the attendees today will know more about than me. Yeah. So the book is all about how 
a little humble half an hour situation comedy can tell you so much about what it's like to be somewhere. And Andy and I, we were talking about how humour is, is great, comedy is great for getting over really complicated, heartfelt stuff in a way that doesn't feel heavy duty. And with something like Dairy Girls, that's provoked huge conversation about deeply complex political issues. So regional comedy and comedy written from the inside. One of the things that our chapters really shares is that these are written by people about their own community. So very much like the work that you're doing, Andy, it's about people writing about themselves as a subject and not the object. So, and hopefully out in September. Oh, well, looking forward to that, Mary. And, uh, I know, speaking from experience living on Barry Island, uh, the transformative effect Gavin and Stacey has had uh, on the Barry community. I mean, prior to Gavin and Stacey, uh, there was very much a culture here of the glass half empty that uh, Barry was very sort of uh, not proud necessarily to come from, but uh, a, a, ne a negative narrative. And uh, Gavin and Stacey's transformed that. It's amazing. Like, you know, we've only got a half a glass for it's a glass and a half uh, overflowing with positivity it's amazing that uh, you couldn't send a memo saying be positive but uh, a comedy show can achieve that sort of thing can't it well tidy yeah um, but i mean i think for example i'm um, something like say citizen khan we've got a great chapter all about that and it's all about exploring the joy and complexity of life in in in, in birmingham and West Midlands. And again, these are communities which are often the subject of the joke. So it's great when you have programmes that are written from the point of view of what it's like to be from there. And as a Glaswegian, I mean, I'm used to my city being the subject of all kinds of stereotypes. And we're lucky we've got Billy Connolly, who speaks really eloquently for us. Yeah, so what got you into studying uh, comedy in the first place, Meriden? I think just that. I think the notion that a little half-hour comedy show is like a time capsule. You know, I like sort of stuff from the 1970s and the 80s. I was watching just recently um, Just Good Friends, Paul Nicholas and Jan Francis, all oh. about London in the 80s. And of course, that's a very different world yeah. to the one now. So I love the fact that in a half-hour show, you get history, culture, geography, politics. You get stuff about gender. Yeah. because the kind of the way in which women are represented i mean that one is great because you've got female lead who is more than an able match for the the blokes but yeah they're, they're a little, little tiny little compressed capsule of stuff and i love opening it as an yeah. academic we're always nosy so i love going in there and scrabbling about you know and that's what tv historians do like what is packed in this 27 28 minutes of text and you know as i say just good friends, suddenly, boom, you're in a kind of 80s London. And that's a really different place to where London is now, which is yeah. good, I think, yeah. and for all kinds of things. So you've done a lot of uh, Thomas Cook tour of laughter and fun and, and mm. sitcoms and stuff. Um, is it is humour the same same thing everywhere, or are there differences between pla different places? Well, so that's, I think, making any hard and fast rule about humour is... is is a kind of hostage to fortune because somebody can be funny without saying anything. Yeah. But I think what's great about something made by people who know an area is you get the cultural references. So there's stuff that you remember, like your grandparents might say, or your neighbours in the housing estate you grew up in. Or I think that humour is a kind of repository of all the stuff that reflects on who you are. And I think it's a cliche, but laughter is sharing. Yeah. And I think there's something great about there's words and phrases, and it'll be the same for everybody here, depending on where they're from. That if you meet somebody from the place you're from, there's stuff that's just funny. So it gives it, I mean, it's definitely then a different accent, uh, literally, mm. to the, the different humours. But also, are there any sort of differences in like, either subjects, emphasis, topics that tend to be covered by in certain regional humours compared to others? I think, yeah, I mean, it will be depending. So like if you're, I mean, I, I talk about Glasgow because that's where I'm from. Yeah. I think we explore how we're always represented, you know, so I think that you get a chance to reflect on how you're seen from the outside and what you're actually like. And Billy Connolly, who is the, the king of comedians, is a great example of somebody who really is so far from the stereotype of Glasgow and Connolly's humour shows an aspect of, of the Glaswegian, which is incredibly witty, 
sharp, whimsical, quite black humour, doesn't suffer fools, which reflects the city I know, which somebody from out with, and there's plenty of representations of us outside of it, don't get that in any kind of sense. That's fascinating watching your body language there, talking oh. about, well, if I might add King of the North of the Board, I've obviously got the King of uh, Balham here, or, or the Mayor of oh, Balham oops. here, sorry. Uh, uh, but uh, just watching your body language and the energy when you spoke about, like, Billy Collin and Glasgow, um, how is it important, like, for well-being like, and stuff to have a, a strong sense of a, a, both a local identity and a local identity that expresses itself through its humour? It's a huge question, isn't it? I suppose if you feel good and secure in who you are, it means that you're much more open to everybody else's identity. Yeah. I think if you're fighting to get heard and seen, I think that in a sense kind of numbs you a little bit to the fact that the great thing about, say, the UK and, and Ireland, whatever, is all kinds of stuff going on. And I think the book that we've produced shows that the, the fight for who we are, what Britishness is, what Glaswegian, London, Birmingham is, it's a constantly shifting narrative, but I think being heard and seen is important. And when identity is exactly like the, the Cockney one, when they're not heard or seen, or they're judged in a particular way, that that's when there's there's tension. Yeah. And do you see um, a positive future in, uh, for regional humour in the sense that we've got like global mass media, um, therefore it's, uh, you know a, a danger of like making things globally bland? Uh, is there a, is there still a space for like, regional humour? That is that is a really good and a lead. That's it leads me in almost as if we'd rehearse this. I'm um, Derry girls about life in a very, very, you know, small part of the UK, Northern Ireland. It went on Netflix and it's now got an international audience and lots of Americans are exploring their Irish heritage. And um, this notion that in fact, people love the detail of other people's cultures. So something like Netflix actually offers the micro and macro audience. So it's interesting how things play in the global perspective People yeah. also love the specificity of other people's culture. So yeah. who's to say? I mean, no one knows anything. Yeah. So uh, as I say, in terms of, uh, like, example, Derrick Girls, which you all love, I mean, uh, what are the qualities that can enable regional comedy to, you know, reach out to a, a potentially global audience? I mean, what are the qualities there? If, if, if we knew that, we, we could make a point. <laughs> we could often write it. Because who would ever have predicted that um, Gavin and Stacey yeah would be this mega hit you know about two yeah. families you know from Essex and South Wales I guess sometimes you just have to write what you've got to write and Arthur probably knows all about that you've got to be who you are yeah. and sometimes who you are just connects and I think you can't predict what will do that but I do think authenticity and someone like Billy Connolly is totally authentic and I think people get that that's a fascinating observation that I say that authentic is um, both, um, and I, I mean, reading about like the musical styles, which will come on to Tom later about, um, uh, you know, the musical styles were popular because people saw a mirror of themselves on the stage and uh, could connect and relate to that. And, uh, and Merit, massive thanks. And we'll come back a bit later on to that. But I think you've given a brilliant bridge there to uh, the, maybe the king or certainly the mayor of Balham, south of uh, the ball. I, I defer. Uh, I defer uh, to, uh, to the uh, Balham royalty. Yeah. <laughs> the Balham, yeah. A bit of deference, please, everyone. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, Arthur, welcome to the show uh, 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 today. And uh, as I say, uh, hope, well, it needs no introduction. I mean, I'm going to, uh, I know it's a, included a number of massive fans in the room here with you. Um, uh, you you've been a, a lead in uh, uh, both in uh, British comedy, both in terms of uh, what you've performed on across radio, TV, uh, documentary, books. Uh, certainly recommend your uh, autobiography and uh, your latest book coming out there. Um, and uh, you also do a tremendous amount of good work, like encouraging new comic talent and so on. Uh, and also to your claim and fame, you're the self-appointed mayor of uh, Balham and uh, uh, so I had a bit of experience or two under your belt when it comes to comedy. So, uh, I mean, Alf, how did you first start, get started in comedy? Well, it was when I was a kid in Bermondsey. And yeah. there was, uh, we had to do, uh, uh, we had to do a version of Peter Pan and I played Captain Hook and I came on with a coat hanger, obviously on my hands and I was determined to frighten everyone. 
So I came on roaring, and in fact, everyone started laughing. And uh, however hard I tried to frighten them, they started laughing more. And I think from that moment on, I thought, oh, yeah, laughter, that's good. And I'd like to do a little joke, all right? No, I won't. Knock, knock. knock. Who's there? M-A-B, it's a big horse. N-A-B is a big horse who? A maybe it's a big old I'm a Londoner. Boom, boom. <laughs> I love. No, we'll get I the old sing along that with the top. Yeah, so, yeah, right. So, I mean, uh, so really we owe that theatre audience, uh, it could have been a career in being a psychopath with a coat hanger to comedy, <laughs> but uh, a profound turning point there, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. And well, so laughter as a... is the, you know, what Victor Borges said, laughter is the shortest distance between two people. And uh, I've always, therefore, cherished laughter as a way of people bringing together. To stand in a room and make people laugh is a wonderful feeling. And laughter is an involuntary thing. And, you know, you like farting or belching, but you don't pay someone to make you go and belch or fart, obviously. Well, I don't I'll know. I'll be a millionaire, mate. If I... <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I started in the uh, early, well, sort of late 70s, early 80s when alternative comedy appeared. And that was all initially centred in London around the comedy store and things that were building up. And um, being a, a Londoner, and that what the idea of alternative comedy was to stand against racism and homophobia and uh, sexism, which was sort of rife in comedy then. And uh, part of being a, there's various things about being a Londoner. One thing is the, the big gag always between North and South Londoners. Yeah. Which I think is a, a trope that goes back centuries, ever since the North Londoners used to sort of go over the river to get off with prostitutes and whatnot in South London. And, I mean, I do a joke about in North London, they have little blue plaques commemorating famous people. In South London, we have big yellow signs saying, did you see this murder? <laughs> and I think, um, but being a Londoner, part of being a Londoner is, because London is the biggest city, obviously, in, in, in well, it's, I think it's probably the biggest city in Europe. And so there's always a slight sense that Londoners are a bit special. And, uh, you know, there's jokes about other regional ones, like a Yorkshireman is like a Scotsman with all the generosity squeezed out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I do a joke about them being a bit thick in Norfolk. In Norfolk, if you say not, not, they go, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a sense that Londoners are a bit special. And, of course, Cockney uh, is the opposite of posh. Uh, yeah. We should bear that in mind, that, that part of being a Cockney is is actually being a bit lower down the rung and having to fight against the posh people who run everything. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, like, you know, say, you've toured extensively. Is, is there a difference between, say, a, a London audience and a, a non-London audience at all? I, mean, you well, know, I don't it's a bit... I think a London audience is a bit more savvy than... Yeah. Uh, than you know, partly because it, it, there's so many comedy clubs in London yeah, more yeah. than anywhere else. And, um, yeah, so I think, uh, I think, yeah, I'd like to say, you know, obviously we Londoners are better than everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> it goes without saying. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, did, did you do any, like, different material for, like, say, a London audience as opposed to a, a Northern audience, stuff like that? Not, not really. I, I, I used to have a joke about uh, how uh, well, I remember I was once in Leeds and a bloke said to me, hey, where are you from? I said, I'm from London. He said, no, you're not. He said, you're a cockney bastard twat. <laughs> what are you? And he was a big bloke and I could see his point of view. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you vary it a bit. And I, wherever you go, you always ask about... I always make a joke. Say, if I'm doing a gig in, uh, I don't know, Leeds, I'll make a joke about how they're all bastards in Sheffield. Yeah. So every every region has its own community, and it's quite good to slag off someone from the nearby community because, I mean, it's always a bit of a joke that you're better than them or... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you know, in, in terms of the flavour of Cockney, I know it's one of the questions in the chat there from uh, Sean about um, uh, 
cockney humour being a bit brutal. I remember, I remember one job uh, appraisal where uh, I was described as my humour is rather aggressive. Um, is there a certain character to sort of London cockney humour, you think? Well, yeah, yeah, it probably is perhaps a bit more aggressive than some other ones. And it's a bit, a certain sense of self-entitlement, obviously, because we're London. We're the biggest city in in Britain. So, obviously, we're a bit special. Although you also, at the same time, take the piss out of that. Yeah. yeah. And I think that satire, a bit, a bit like the sort of the West Ham clip there, where it's sort of self-deprecation and um, uh, sort of a mutual humbling is at stake. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I don't mind people taking the piss out of me, like being London or whatever, Cockney or whatever, uh, if they're like an accident. The only time I got annoyed was when a posh person did it to me and I got really angry. Yeah, exactly. You know? well, I think that is that is a key, you know, uh, yeah. Remember the song East End Boys and West End Girls? Oh, the old pet shop girls, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, I, I think there's something to that. And when I first started appearing on Loose Ends on Radio 4, the, the, the idea then was that the guests who tended to be posh girls and, and working class boys were often on the, you know, on the panel on that. Yeah. Uh, does that get to you, like, I mean, on the media that... Uh... Um, we're thinking of doing a report next year called Dick Van Dyke, All is Forgiven, in the <laughs> sense that, uh, like, yeah, the world's worst Cockney accent. But if yeah. you look at any, like, my kids, my grandkids go and watch, like, Puss in Boots and Matilda Musical, and they say, well, why do the baddies talk like you, Grandad? And uh, at least Dick Van Dyke was a good guy. And does that get on your nervous a bit about <laughs> sort of, um, that there's not enough sort of working class London Cockney voices? Uh, on these sort of shows? Well, it doesn't piss me off, but I think there's no doubt that, um, you know, people will take a posh voice more seriously. Uh, yeah. And, and which is annoying, obviously. And obviously, accents change as well. I think since there's more diversification in, in London, the, the accent has moved on from the standard, you know, within the sound of bow bells yeah. and that thing. And have you noticed a change in that the humour? I mean, from when you first started to now, what in what ways has humour evolved, changed, adapted? Well, I mean, at the moment, obviously, it's a bit of a a bit of a dangerous area. There's so many things that you know it's a bit difficult at the moment. Making jokes about certain things can can be a bit dodgy. I think since social media has has made a bit of a, an impact on it all. Yeah. And, uh... But do you think actually like the point Mary made earlier about um, that actually people have more self-confidence? I mean, one of the big lessons I've taken on board since doing all this stuff is that me being who I am doesn't stop you being who you are. And um, and maybe like we should like, embrace these uh, identities and be more self-confident and therefore can be more robust, resilient and, you know, uh, take it and give it sort of thing. Yeah, I agree with you. Although, you know, there are certain things, that you, certain jokes that are offensive and uh, yeah. you, you want to walk out of. Yeah, yeah. But it's changing. And as I say, but um, hopefully, as I say, by sort of what we're doing this campaign and stuff, uh, people can be a bit more uh, confident and uh, embracing and inclusive uh, as well as being like, you know, celebrating our difference and stuff. I mean, uh, uh, have you got, I mean, have you got, uh, in terms of Cockney comedy, have you got any favourite Cockney comedians or Cockney TV shows? Well, I used to love Steptoe and Son when I was Yeah. There, uh, which was very, a uh, very London, uh, that was a Cockney thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and as I say, great also like age generational conflict, and uh, also you had the things about like aspirations, you know, Ari H. Corbett trying to go posh and uh, Wilfred Bramble bringing him down and stuff. So, yeah, as you say, it's a great sort of window into reality of London working class life, yeah. Yeah, and there's lots of, you know, Nish Kumar is a, he's a Cockney comedian in a way. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so that, yeah, it's, it's it's ever expanding and ever changing, just like the accent changes. I mean, yeah. like me and you, our accent is a bit old fashioned in a way. I think. Well, well like more more mature, maybe I don't know in a yeah. way, but uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, is there any sort of Cockney comedies that you didn't like? Um, you know, sort of that got on your nerves as being maybe a bit pastiche character. Well, I mean, Press caricature. Two part. I sort of it was it was a bit tricky looking back on it at uh, what, what you know what some of the stuff that was said there. But uh, no, I don't think I don't. There's no comedy shows I really hate to be honest. Yeah, and, uh, and then in, in terms of going forward, um, are you going to be doing like do you see yourself like just uh, doing less or more of like stuff that tells your story? I mean, well, 
Oh no, no. I think you know, there's no end to stories you can tell. I, I was, I was going to be doing a show. I'm not now, but I've, I've got it in mind to do a show about being a, a Londoner in Paris because I spent a year in Paris and it was quite interesting to to learn yeah. some of the French uh, conceptions of what uh, what it was like in Britain, particularly London, like the way they they think English food is disgusting, or they used to. I, I think yeah. not so much now. And the, uh, I learned that the French word for ur is berk when I started talking about jelly. Yeah. Jelly is, and baked beans are particularly offensive to, <laughs> to French. And for all foreigners, I think, baked beans are disgusting to everyone else in the world except the British. Oh, primer. Backhead beans, as they call them in France. <laughs> Let's to rhyme with smackhead. <laughs> uh, so a bit of Gershwin there, like a Cockney Gershwin in the uh, uh, version of that stuff. And uh, uh, can you see yourself doing like maybe like a Cockney music or something like that at all going forward? Uh, maybe, yeah. Well, you, you can write the lyric. I'll write the lyrics, and uh, we'll get uh, Tim to do the music. All right, fun. Well, it was a really good pie mash. Uh, so it was a really good April Fool by one of the pie mash shops uh, where they claimed that uh, uh, there was going to be a, a, a film coming out with, uh, bloody forgot his name now, the Cockney actor, but set in a pie mash shop. So we might have some uh, uh, ingredients there, Arthur, going Lovely. forward. Okay. Well, listen, uh, Arthur, I'm going to cue on Tom. Uh, who's got his Joanna at the ready yeah. there. And uh, as I say, elaborate a bit more about this idea about Cockney identity and song and human, our culture. Uh, Tom, welcome to the, this, uh, the, the show today. Afternoon, nice to see you. Uh, lovely to see you. Now, Tom, tell me a bit about yourself. Uh, you're, you're musical director of uh, is it Wilton's Musical. Uh, you've had a career as a musical director, uh, perform ca uh, cabaret and, and, and sing-along sessions in pubs. Uh, uh, and yet, as I understand it, you're from originally from Coventry. Is that right? Absolutely. I don't have a Cockney bone in my body, I'm afraid. But uh, I came to my love of, of Cockney humour, I suppose, and, and Cockney songs through um, the Victorian Music Hall which I absolutely adore. Um, so kind of for those people who don't really kind of understand, we're talking the kind of 1850s through till, well, really kind of the outbreak of the First World War. Um, that was the kind of height, the, the peak of kind of Victorian and Edwardian musical, which then turned into variety. Um, but yeah, that's where I love, I, I kind of learned these songs from, singing them, um, being taught them as a kid, I suppose, singing yeah. them in scout variety shows. Um, and now I make a living pushing my mobile piano around and leading lovely people like you guys in a good old fashioned sing along. What was it about, like, then, the musical and these songs that are so appealing and attractive to you? I don't know. Definitely the humour. Definitely the humour. Um, uh, the innuendo, the wink and the nudge. Um, but just the fact they're so sing-alongable. They're so... Um, they, and they get passed on. Many of these songs written over 100 years ago, which are still sung nowadays, things like Daisy Daisy and I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. They're songs that are still known and passed on and songs that your parents and your grandparents sang. Um, <laughs> but they've got a real energy to, to them. And also the fact that when you're singing them all together as a community, um, that amazing feeling you get when everyone's singing along. You can't beat it. Yeah. It's funny, it picks up on like Mary's and Arthur Smith about comedy being like participative in that if you're listening either in the joke or listening and taking part in the sing-along, it's, it's very much like a communal aspect, a communal dimension to it going forward there. Oh, absolutely. I always, I always joke at my gigs, there is nothing more embarrassing than a sing-along sung alone. <laughs> these songs rely and um and that's the way they got passed on i mean you look at um the music hall songs things like that we even know still today things like my old man said follow the van and mario lloyd hit the queen of the music halls but these songs were, were about the audience joining in on the chorus they needed to be easily picked up um so most of these kind of music hall songs would have a verse chorus verse chorus verse chorus and so by the time you get to the last chorus everybody in the audience is singing along they may well know it they've they probably heard it it's one of these songs that they may well have heard Myrie lloyd perform before and they and they knew or that they might have bought the sheet music for it and Aunt Doris could play the piano and you'd all be singing along and they get passed on and, and from generation to generation. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it relied on that kind of community feeling of everyone joining in um, for these songs to live on. Yeah. And have you got any particular favourite songs with uh, an interesting backstory you can sort of share and maybe give a demonstration of, my friend? Yeah, of course. I mean, I was thinking um, 
about talking today about kind of Cockney humour specifically, um, and the difference between that and kind of British humour. There's lots of there's lots of um, uh, tropes in in kind of British comedy, things like um, innuendo, at satire and absurdity, and the kind of a, a, a black humour, kind of macabre humour, which do appear in Cockney tunes, Cockney songs, but are kind of universal around the UK, around in British comedy. Um, but certainly for me, um, the the real kind of Cockney um, humour or comes from kind of finding humour in misfortune. So you have something like My Old Man Said Follow the Van. It sounds like a joyous song, but it's actually about doing a midnight flit in the middle of the night because you can't afford to pay the rent. So you pack yeah. all your belongings on the cart. Um, and also... Um, it's already been mentioned that kind of positive outlook, that kind of Cockney um, uh, kind of vision of, of, yeah, looking outside or, or of their of their what might be kind of terrible conditions. Things like um, Gus Elands, if it wasn't for the hours in between. Um, no, it really is a very pretty garden, and Chingford to the eastward could be seen. With a ladder and some glasses, you could see two acne marshes. If it wasn't for the hours, is in between. There we go. Just a song where he's looking beyond. He's he's um a kind of stoicism that kind of Cockneys have about um yeah th looking on the bright side, I suppose. Um, and again, things like that, that that echo with other comics that we know. Another well, as as Mary's mentioned, the the kind of sitcom tropes as well. People like Del Boy in Only Fools and Horses. This time next year, Rodney will be millionaires. That kind yeah. of Cockney stoicism, looking ahead, looking outside. Um, and uh, obviously Cockney food, um, hot meat pies, saveloys and trotters, jelly oh. eels, all appear in songs, bull beef and carrots. I mean, you could have a whole PhD on those kind of songs in themselves. Yeah. Um, and of course, the origins, of the use of rhyming slang in songs as well. Um, things like Barra Boy. All my life I wanted to be a Barra Boy, a Barra Boy I've always wanted to be. Up the apples and pears and across the Rory Moor. I'm off to see my dear old trouble and strife. I mean, it's just, it's all there. And joyous songs, um, things like What a Mouth, um, which Tommy Steele recorded in the 1960s. Yeah. Um, but again, another classic uh, uh, kind of musical song written by R.P. Weston, I think, um, back in the teens, which um, again, yeah, looking on the bright side and making making fun of misfortune. Jimmy Bean, who's a funny looking fella, he's, if, if he had another mouth and a different smeller, but his race queered him, his face queered him from winning a beauty show because it was so, so loud, lo um, uh, larger mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And some of these songs, and I've got some uh, uh, really unusual beginnings and some you least expect. I mean, uh, uh, okay, but like the old bull and bush has got uh, some funny origins. Indeed, it's not actually a Cockney song at all, I'm afraid. And we all know it. Come, come, come and make eyes at me down at the old bull and bush. Da, 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 da. Again, a huge hit for Florrie Ford, but it wasn't actually a Cockney tune. That was actually an American song, um, which Florrie Ford heard when she was in the States, um, um, when she was touring. And it was a, a, an advertising jingle, a kind of beer garden drinking song for the Anheuser-Busch Brewery who make Budweiser beer. So the original lyrics went, come, come, drink a Budweiser with me under the Anheuser-Busch, Bush, Bush. She heard it liked it, didn't like the lyrics, and asked the American lyricists to write, a, to adapt the lyrics to, for, an English, uh, for an English audience. So, of course, they penned it about the old bull and bush up in Hampstead. Right. So, what about I, old man's a dustman? I want to hear that. There are oh, a bit of Lonnie Donegan, 1960s. Well, now, actually, Lonnie Donegan, originally born in Glasgow, so oh. we can no, lay, lay no claim to him. But, <laughs> of course, um, uh, he grew up in East Ham, I think. Um, and, I mean, again, it's just classic. It's gets, again, those stock characters in musical songs, people like the strong women <coughs> like Myrie Lloyd, browbeat and husbands, dustman, Coleman, publicans, tramps, costermongers, all of these, um, summed up in this. Oh, my old man's a dustman. He wears an husband's hat. He wears cold blimey trousers and he lives in a council flat. He looks a proper nana in his great big hobnail boots. He's got such a job to pull them up that he calls them Daisy Roots. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Yeah. So, so well, we've got to maybe go into a morph into a, a, a request show here. But so, in terms of, I mean, Tom, I mean, uh, what sort of what sort of reaction? I mean, you've got a wonderful reaction here doing that. I mean, what sort of reaction do you get when you're out uh, live doing your show, mate? It's great because these songs, 
really uh, resonate with people. And for, if we all have a different frame of reference to where we know them from. People of a certain generation may know the musical songs from the good old days, if you remember the good yeah. old days on TV. Films didn't lead to city varieties, of course. Um, uh, or songs from the wartime, songs that their parents and their grandparents have sang. I even remember learning some of these songs at school. Um, and again, they get passed on. So it's a real cross-generational thing in the same way that Chaz and Dave, any Chaz and Dave fans out there? They, they were great yeah. music hall fans and they kept a lot of these songs alive, recording some of these songs that hadn't been recorded for, for 60 or 70 years um, and passing them on. So again, for Chaz and Dave, they're a huge fan base um, of all generations because it's a family thing. It's a community thing about mm. these songs being passed on. So the reaction I get at gigs is always lovely and warm. I, um, and again, equally, even to a, to a Cockney audience, even to an East End audience, I'm, I'm always, I'm always make it clear at the top of the show that I say I'm not a Cockney, but I love these songs. I've always been fascinated with London since I was a kid growing up, I suppose, always fascinated by London, um, the social history of London, and just the city, the kind of energy in the city, um, which is kind of summed up in these songs. And to be able to share that with people, especially with a certain generation, that, that, that older um, Cockney um, generation who are dying out, really, or have moved out, of those families that have moved out into Essex or, or further into North Kent, those kind of generations that, that for these... For those people, these songs mean so much. They're part of their history. They're part of that Cockney, Cockney culture. Um, to be able to share those with those people that, that resonate so much. And as I said, even despite me not being a Cockney, kind of yeah. feeling part of that feeling part of that legacy of these songs that have, that have lived on. Um, and because there's only a handful of us peddling yeah. these tunes anymore and keeping them alive. So, um, yeah, passing on these songs and keeping them going. Do you think more should be done to in schools? I mean, like you know, this should be part of like the school curriculum. So uh, we've recently uh, we're in the process of um, getting Cockney recognised as a community language uh, by Tower Hamlets Council. And uh, one of the things I'd love to see is like someone like yourself and the, the sort of, like education we're having here being uh, made available and shared with school kids. I mean, would you like to see more of that happen? Oh, that'd be amazing. I mean, I've already done a little bit of that in the kind of outreach work that I've done with Brick Lane Music Hall. We play, we work in schools and we, we sing these kind of songs to kids. I've done some of my own concerts and workshops in schools. I did one at um, uh, one of the schools on Brick Lane um, uh, a few years ago um, and because they, they were studying, they, one of their topics was maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. Um, yeah. And that's uh, amazing to, to, to teach these songs to a, to a, a class of kind of year four kids um, yeah. and for the majority of them the the, the, the kind of um, English isn't the kind of the, their, their, the main language that's spoken at home to teach these kids these songs and for them to learn something about those Cockney traditions and how this legacy of kind of um, yeah. Cockney song and Cockney culture continues yeah. um, it's amazing so no more of that would be great and, and yeah for, for, for certainly in Tower Hamlets for Cockney being recognised as a language and a culture that's yeah it's amazing so we're going to ask the mayor of Ballum to make probably make you an official Cockney. So, to, but uh, but <laughs> before he does that, um, would you want to sing us out with a, a, a sing us up with a lovely song, mate? Well, perhaps it has to be what was voted uh, a few years ago as the most popular um, music hall song or most famous music hall song by the British Music Hall Society. Um, and it's a bit of Myrie Lloyd, as I said, I mentioned it earlier on. But uh, you all know the chorus, don't you? It goes like this. My old man said, follow the van and don't dilly-dally on the way. Oh, we go, Off went the car with me own packed in it. I walked behind with me old cockle in it. But I dillied and dallied, dallied and I dillied. Lost me way and don't know where to roam. But you can't trust the specials like the old time coppers when you can't find your way home. <laughs> Yeah. That's great. Well done, Nita. I know. Well, well, and as I say, um, uh, not another banana in sight there, but a wonderful sing along there, mate. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I say, so uh, uh, before we go, I just want to sort of really some formal point announcements before we go, and then we'll have a, a sort of an open up discussion there uh, about what, the, uh, what we've heard today going forward. Bear me a second there. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so we've touched upon there. So we're working with Tower Hamlets Council, which was a major decision. First time ever in 660 years of the history of Cockney culture, it's been formally recognised and embraced. And so we're actively looking at, you know, bringing school uh, Cockney into education, into culture, in the curriculum. Um, and also, as I say, uh, we're working uh, next 
already planning for next year, where we're looking not only just at a, a modern Cockney Festival 2024, but a Common People's Festival UK, because we've really stumbled upon the fact that working class cultures don't have cultural institutions. Uh, uh, and as a result, their story gets defied and told by others. So we're creating a platform for that. Uh, anyone who's interested, there's some contacts there. Do drop me a line. I work for Grow Social Capital, a social enterprise, uh, and uh, or visit our website. And uh, as I say, uh, do get in touch, keep in touch with us going forward. Uh, but obviously, let's have a little now and now about going forward. Uh, so really open up to the floor there, if anyone. Uh, just some uh, final points, really, from... Um, uh, uh, Mary, any final observation for what you've heard today? I think the point you just made there, Andy, about working class culture is really important. And I think that comedy and the field that I'm interested in is a place where working class culture is preserved and played with and used to punch up. So I think that's key. Great. Oh, Arthur, what about you, mate? I mean, have you enjoyed yourself so far? And um, as I say, anything you sort of taken away from it? Well, when a, when a man is tired of London, he's tired of life. When a man is tired of Swindon, he's been there about 10 minutes. <laughs> so is Stu. Uh, so anything for you, mate, before we uh, open up the floor? No, again, just to reiterate what you, you, you said there, Andy, and Mary as well, just the fact that, um, that yeah, it's working class culture. Music Hall specifically was predominantly working class audiences. Um, and it has always meant that over the years, the history being written of it has, has, has never been, it's never been formalized in the same way that the other, other culture has been analyzed. So yeah, you're making progress here with the fact that we're moving forward. And yeah, we need to tell these stories and keep it, keep that legacy of it, of it going. Can I, just, can I just pick up on Tom's point? Also, I think pantomime, Certainly in, in Glasgow, pantomime is huge. Absolutely. And with young kids as well. So that's another form of working class culture that's there, still going on. It's kind of under the radar, I suppose, yeah. officially. So I saw the Mother Goose with Sir Ian McLennan on Friday in Cardiff and very much that sort of culture alive there. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, in fact, Arthur, have you ever done pantomime? Uh, yeah, I was in a pantomime in Denmark, in Copenhagen. This is about... <laughs> 38 years ago or something. Yeah, they involve a skull in your hand and uh, a last year, <laughs> or it, won't it? No, but I like a bit of Hamlet too. But uh, <laughs> it was interesting there because they saw pantomime as some kind of arcane theatrical form, a bit like if we were watching Kibuki Theatre or something. So mm. if you said, oh, no, he isn't, you could just see him reading their notes before they went, oh, yes, he is. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And I was Nurse Nelly Nightcap. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm up for a bit of panto again sometime. All right, well, go on the open. Okay, let's open up to the floor there. Uh, I know one or two faces in the room got questions. Uh, uh, my dear friend, a fellow South London for you, Arthur. Uh, uh, Graham, there, did you want to uh, ask, ask a question, mate? Uh, I can't think of anything specific, but um, I, I, I'd like to say how much I've enjoyed this. Yeah, and thanks, Arthur and Mary and, and Tom, Tom Starr. Um, very good. No, I'll sit back and I'll think of something. Give All me right. five. Give me. Give me ten seconds. All right. It sound like you're talking to the wife there. But anyway, to Sean, mate, do you want to? Yeah, you mute, mate. It's that Sean. We can't hear you, mate. <laughs> it's like having Marcel Mathieu on the phone in. Hello, 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 hello Sean. Sean. We can hear you now, mate. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think what you're doing is a healthy corrective. If you think that the, the comments about the BBC becoming more um, uh, of a sort of, of middle class um, 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 establishment with public schools, uh, children getting in, that the Cockney um, or the working class uh, aspect uh, might might be actually being swamped by by other forms. And and as you said, Going to uh, uh, the, the music halls would have been a very cheap experience. The last time I tried to go to London, it was like £120 a ticket to see anything. So the, 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 the place for them to share that is probably also disappearing as well. Yes, I think a subject Sife's very concerned about like these, these spaces, even like, like say, things like street markets. Yeah, you see, so much human. match. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, uh, a recent Cockney was from Pakistan. They pound a fish man at uh, Upton Park Market, who appeared on national yeah, telly. Yeah. And that was a great platform for uh, like sh literally street humour they're going for. Uh, yeah. Anyone else want to sort of say anything? Uh, 
I say, what conversation now? I'm Anyone afraid not... uh, I've got to go because I've got a dentist appointment. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Well, Arthur, listen, oh, let, let's, call, <laughs> let's formally end the show now, but we're going to have a linger around. Arthur, hopefully it's not as painful uh, experience uh, for you, mate, but it's been a delight here. And, um, you know, just think of some of those great songs that Tom shared uh, uh, yeah. to see you through your Lord suffering. Blimey, mate. Governor, it's been a right old pea suitor and no mistake. Brilliant, mate. Right. Lovely. Lovely. Right. Well, thanks, me, old China. And uh, as I say, thank you, everyone in the room here for joining. So, I do you want to stop the recording? And can we have a big round of thank you for our panel for an excellent, excellent brilliant contributions there? That is really, really appreciated. Uh, we're going to have